So uh, we are going to start in a new sermon series called, uh, uh, just titled Ephesians, as we go through the, um, the book of Ephesians together. And just a quick introduction to what the book is and why we're talking about it. Um, we, we just are taking kind of a hi- hiatus, a break from a series in the book of Acts. And a lot of the last section of the book of Acts that we talked about actually centered on the city of Ephesus. And um, the message of the book of Ephesians, it, it's, it's the Apostle Paul writing to this church in the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor in modern-day Turkey. Uh, and it's a, it's a message of divine reconciliation, that is, reconciliation between us and God. And then because of that reconciliation, a unity among God's people through Christ and then a call to live as those called out people in a world that doesn't know Christ. And uh, the, the letter to the Ephesians was written by Paul while he was imprisoned uh, in Rome, estimated around the, the year AD 60. Um, so where we left off in the book of Acts, if you're here for that, Paul was going back to Jerusalem and he was about to be arrested and brought to Rome. Once he got to Rome he wrote the letter to the Ephesians and sent it back to them. And I'm going to be up front with you. There's actually quite a bit of debate whether the, the book of Ephesians was actually written to the church at Ephesus. Um, and you might say, what? No, it's called that. That title was added actually quite a bit later, and actually some manuscripts don't have the words um, in Ephesus at the very beginning of it, and the letter doesn't have anything in it specific about the city of Ephesus. It is written kind of to be a shared epistle, which means a letter that would be distributed between a lot of different churches dealing with the same things, and actually sounds very similar to a lot of the things that Paul writes in, uh, to the church at Colossus, which is not that far from Ephesus. Um, um, I have no problem thinking that it was written to the church at Ephesus, but as most letters were the case back then, um, epistles like this, they would be written to a community with the intent of, it's not going to be just you guys that read it, it's going to be shared. And if you think that's strange, we are reading it today as somebody who it would not have been written to. So think about that. We read the book of uh, Ephesians, and it's not written to us directly. If it was written to the church at Ephesus, we're not the church at Ephesus, but the principles are universal, and they apply to us throughout time and and all of human history. So so with that in mind, we're going to pray, and we're going to dive into the first 14 verses of chapter 1 here to get a sense for what is... God's message through the Apostle Paul to the church struggling with being God's people in a world that doesn't want them to be, doesn't want them to be set apart and different. Um, and what is God's word to us in that? So we're going we're gonna to pray and dive into to God's word for us today. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would send your spirit Fill us, Lord, you, you, you promise us wherever two or more are gathered in your name, you're there in the midst of them. So we ask that you be in our midst this morning, that you would empower us to understand your truth, that you would speak your truth today through me. Give your strength, give us ears to hear what you have to say, minds to comprehend it, hearts to be set upon doing it, and hands and feet that are set to be on mission for you. Show us who you are. And as we look at your word today, show us who we are because of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, you'll notice the name of the sermon today is, Who Do You Think You Are? And uh, we hear that question, right? Who do you think you are? And it can have a lot of different meanings depending on how... For one thing, it's intoned, like how we say it. If I'm like, who do you think you are? Like, it's pretty accusatory. Like, I'm saying you think you're something that you're not in a bad way. Um, uh, that's not how I mean it here. It, it, it's really meant to mean, like, who, who, do, you, who do you think that you, who, what's your identity? Who do you think that you are? The book of Ephesians sets out from the get-go, Paul sets out to answer that question for us. Who are we? 
So starting in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, by the way, just take note, I have, uh, you'll see throughout the text today that's on the screen, there's some words italicized. Just, it's more for just kind of a reference point. You'll, you'll see why in a minute here. So Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, um, and he calls himself that. He calls himself an apostle chosen by God. There's some terms that we like to throw around as the church um, and not really do a really good job of defining what those terms mean, and I try not to do that. I like to kind of take a second and say, when we say apostle, what do we mean by that? An, um, the term apostle in Greek, it's apostolos. It means, literally means someone who is sent out. A sent one. And what this is a reference to is a missionary with a divine authority to establish and lead the church. Um, Paul is an apostle. There are, there are several apostles. There's not, um, despite what, you know, kind of the, sometimes we, we like ni nice, neat packages and numbers. We'll say like, oh, there was 12 apostles. There was 12 disciples who Jesus sent out um, and then one of them, Judas, betrayed, and then they replaced him. But then others were added to that number. And that, um, that, that role of apostle is basically much like a modern-day missionary. They, their role was to establish the church and, and lead it, but apostolic leadership wasn't necessarily something that was localized. It was more a little bit universal. Um, in other words, they weren't like pastors of local churches or elders of local churches. Sometimes they might have been that too, but like Paul specifically, he didn't stay anywhere for very long. In fact, Ephesus um, and Corinth were the two places he stayed the longest, and in total he was only in Corinth for a little, about 18 months to two years, and he was in Ephesus for a little over two years, maybe up to three years. Um, but that's the longest he stayed anywhere. He, his role was to, to help establish the church by preaching the gospel and seeing people come to Christ, building up those believers, establishing local leaders, equipping them for leadership, and then moving on and staying in contact with them, but not having a, a long-term goal of, I'm going to stay in this location for, because he's like, that's not my job. My calling is to, to plant healthy churches and, and see people come to Christ in different communities. And that's what he was doing. And he had that relationship with the people of Ephesus. It was written to the church in Ephesus. Like I said, there's some question about that. The term um, uh, to the saints in Ephesus, that, that in Ephesus doesn't appear in all the texts. So there's some question about that. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, it is written definitely they would have received this. Um, to give you a little bit of a history of, of the city of Ephesus, it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire when this was written. It was the largest city on the, um, in what we would call the Middle East, of that time, um, Paul had spent over two years building up the church there, um, around five years before this letter was written. So he had an established relationship with them, but it'd been a while. And you, and you might say, um, there's some, like the reason that I bring up the whole, like, you know, there's questions of, was, did he actually write this to the church at Ephesus? Is because he says some things that seem a little odd for somebody who would have known them really well. Like, I've heard about your faith as if he hadn't like, experienced it firsthand. But to put this in perspective, I've been here five years. I've been here five years as of like a month ago, okay? Which means the church I served before this, I haven't been to for five years. That church is a different church today than it was five years ago. There's different people there. Um, it's, there's a different ethos to that church. It would be, I mean, it would make sense that I still know some people, but like for me to say, like, I know all about you guys. If I don't really, that would be, you know, insincere. So there's been a little bit of a time gap here. Um, Paul calls the church holy and faithful. And sometimes when you read the beginning of, of the epistles, the letters, the letters of the New Testament, so that would be, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you know, all the way basically through, we'll say at least Philemon. Um, those are the Pauline epistles. 
those are written to individuals or churches. Um, there's typically kind of this traditional, kind of the way they open letters back then, that's what we're seeing here. Um, but there's more to that. This isn't just something to skip over and say, yeah, Paul's writing to Ephesus, let's move on. He's calling them, as the church, he's calling them something specific here. He's calling them holy and faithful. And he is going to take some time in the, in the, in the, um, the verses that are to follow describing what he means by holy and faithful. And then he does, he ends this section by greeting them with a, a traditional Greek greeting, which is the word charis in Greek, which just means grace. And he would use, he uses the word areno in Greek, but he, it would be shalom in, in Hebrew, the, the typical Jewish salutation. So um, Jews greet each other during that time with the term shalom, meaning peace. And, and Greeks would say charis, meant like, meant like, it means grace, but it just means like, Blessings to you, like, nice to see you kind of thing. Um, Paul probably means more that by it than just traditional greetings, but there is something about the fact that he's using a Greek salutation and a Jewish one, because this is also a theme of the book of Ephesians. The church has historically, up to this point in time in, um, of the writing of Ephesians, been overwhelmingly Jewish, and it is seeing a shift to becoming more and more Gentile, and he's... He is saying out of the bat, my, this message is for Christians, regardless if you're Jewish or Gentile. This is for you. And he's going to actually build a case for how there needs to be unity in Christ, regardless of what your ethnic background is. <clears throat> which, which, uh, which brings us to something that is a major theme of the book of Ephesians. So as much as we're kind of getting into the beginning of the book, I also want to make sure that we're also kind of getting a sense of what, what we're going to see as we go throughout the book. Paul is going to time and again um, talk about being in Christ or use some variation of that terminology throughout the letter. He does not just mean when he says you are in Christ that you believe in Jesus. That is not what he means by that. It certainly means that you believe in Jesus, but it means more than just that. Being in Christ is actually a positional statement. It means that when God the Father looks at us as his people, he sees Jesus. Our meditation verse for, the, for today says, and you too were included in Christ when you first heard the word of faith, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, means that we, we have an identity in Christ as believers, meaning that we are positionally in Jesus. When God the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus. And that means that we need to find our identity in that relationship. Thus the name of the sermon today. Who do you think you are? Because God has a lot to say about who he says we are, which is very much in contradiction to what the world says we are and a lot of the lies that we believe about who we are. Not only do we find our identity in that relationship, but we receive the benefits of that relationship. We receive access to God's power and presence through that identity of being in Christ. And as is the case, always, with those benefits come responsibilities. And we'll talk about those too. In fact, the book of Ephesians is in some ways divided into two sections. And the second section talks a lot more about how do you live this out. This idea of being in Christ is one of the major themes of the book of Ephesians. It is so overwhelmingly present that it appears 12 times in the first 15 verses. Now, I'm going to point out something to you. It doesn't always say in Christ when it, Paul is using talking about this idea. He doesn't always say the term, the, the, the term in Christ. And here's why. 
<clears throat> first of all, because you vary language when you're trying to make a point. If you just kind of keep saying the same thing, it kind of you zone it out. But also because that is not how language works. Um, in the Greek, in English, we would say in Christ. That's two words. It's the word in, which is a preposition, and then the word Christ, which is the uh, indirect object of that preposition, if you're like a grammar nerd. Yeah, hey, I'm taking advanced Greek grammar right now. I'm, it's in my head. It's just a thing. Um, but that is not how Greek works. Koine Greek that the New Testament was written in doesn't have, it does have prepositional phrases. It does say like ente uh, Christos, uh, Christo, um, in, in Christ that way, but it could just say to Christo, and you could translate that as in Christ. It, the language works differently. So sometimes it will say through Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ. That is a translational choice, but behind it is the same idea. And that is Paul repeats this phrase time and time and time again, this concept, because he's trying to get it into the church's head that who you are where you find your identity is in Jesus. So keep that in mind. In fact, what I did was, just to go back for a split second here, that first place, the faithful in Christ Jesus. You see it right away in verse 2, and I, I have it um, italicized the rest of the, the verses for today while we go through them. Where you see an italicize, it means that phraseology is behind what the translation there. So he starts, he, he begins the letter kind of in earnest by saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Same terminology in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Do you see all the different ways that Paul's doing this here? It's in Christ. It's in, it's in Jesus Christ. It's in the one he loves. It's in him. It's, all, it's, through, it's, it's repeated again and again. And then actually here, it's not back-to-back -back in Greek. It's word order is different in Greek. It says, in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace he lavished on us. In fact, I would argue that that last verse, that the first part of verse 8, would be better translated, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace he's lavished on us in him. That is, in, in Jesus So this is a little different than how we normally have sermon notes. By the way, just a quick note, the sermon notes are the right notes for this week, right? You guys are following along so far? Great. Last week I made the mistake of putting a week old sermon notes in. That's what happens when uh, you're doing a lot of stuff. So you'll notice here it says we are dot, dot, dot. There's a bunch of things that we're going to fill in. And then it's going to say we are again later because this is exactly what Paul's doing. He's laying out what it means to be in Christ, our identity in Jesus. And the first thing he says that is that we are blessed. The term blessed in Scripture, um, the word blessed in the New Testament, makarios, comes from a, 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 um, it's, it's a, it's a borrowed word from, um, the word is Greek, but the concept is, is very much Old Testament. It's the idea of God having his hand upon us. And not like in a heavy-handed way, not like a, he's pushing us down. It's the idea of God's hand of protection upon us. It's like God standing next to us and putting his hand on his shoulder and saying, I got you. That's what blessed means. It says we are blessed in Christ. But we are blessed for a purpose. And time and time and time and time again in Ephesians and, and throughout the New Testament, but Paul, especially in Ephesians, 
will do this where he says, you, here is who you are, but you're, this is why you're this way. Um, so, some of you guys know this. Some of you maybe don't know this. I'm, I'm, kind, of a, I'm kind of a nerd. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, being a nerd was a bad thing. That has changed. I'm, I'm okay saying I'm a nerd. I, like, um, I grew up reading a lot of comic books. Um, I, I like Marvel. DC's fine. You know, Batman's great, but Marvel's my jam. And my, my, the hero that I always liked the most in Marvel, especially when I was younger, was Spider-Man. And it, and it wasn't because, um, if, you, if you're, if you're uh, like, you guys are like, really? You're going to talk about comic books? Yeah, absolutely, because some of you will relate and some of you won't, and that's fine. Um, it wasn't because there's this cool kid, because he wasn't cool, who uh, had these amazing powers, though he did. It was about this teenage kid who struggled with who he was constantly. That's the story. It wasn't about Spider-Man. It was about Peter Parker, who just, like, couldn't make rent, and he was always trying to help people, and it always backfired on him. And, like, he constantly was just, like, struggling and didn't really understand who he was. And I was like, I relate to that. That's why I don't like Superman. I don't like Superman. You can't relate to him. Like, what are you going to relate to? Oh, you could do everything, and you're, the only thing you're weak to is a rock from your own planet, which is very rare here. You know, like, oh, no. You know, I never got it. Spider-Man I related to, but the thing about, if you know anything about Spider-Man, is Spider-Man has kind of a catchphrase. Not a catchphrase, it's not a catchphrase. It's a motto that he lives by, which is why his life is so hard. And the motto is, with great power comes great responsibility. And I remember the first time I was really understanding the idea of being God's child. And then reading through Ephesians, this was 20 years ago maybe, and seeing Paul say, you are called to be God's child. You are blessed. But here's the responsibility that you bear because of that. And he will say this again and again. You have great power because you are God's. But that means you have responsibility in how you use that. And so Paul will say this here. He says, you're blessed. That is, we have God's hand on us. But the purpose of that is so that we would live holy and blameless lives. Now, by the way, Paul is not saying live holy and blameless lives so that you might have God's hand upon you. It is because you are, have God's hand upon you, because you have this relationship with God through Jesus. This is the expectation that you will live a holy and blameless life. Now, let me describe what holy and blameless is before you think, like, you've got to be perfect, because that is not what this call is. The word holy and the word blameless do not mean perfect. Holy means to be set apart for God's purpose. That's what it means. It means to be set apart. We are, as if, you, if you know God through Jesus Christ, you are called holy. Not because you are a great person, but because God has set you apart from the rest of the world and say, you are mine, and I want you to live like you're mine. You should not look like the world. You should look different. You are set apart for me. And the word blameless is actually a word that is used to refer to sacrifices being without blemish. Sometimes people will refer to this as morally clean, and it means that, but it doesn't mean that we are morally clean on our own. Like, I don't do anything wrong. No. It is, we have been made holy and we have been made blameless. Not because of our own striving, not because we were good people. We're not good people. If, you're, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you say, I'm a pretty good person, I don't know that you understand the gospel. We're not good people. We have been made holy. We have been made blameless. 
not because we're good on our own, but because Jesus did that through his sacrifice for us. The work of the Holy Spirit in us makes us holy and makes us blameless. It's who we are because we're his. I thought about using really poor English to, but I, honestly, I, I, I specifically thought of Nancy, and she's going to be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe he, she said this wrong. he said this wrong. I thought about calling the sermon, whose do you think you are? But that is horrible English. Because this is not a question of who you are, it's whose you are. That's why we had the song up front that we had. It's about who you belong to. And that's the second part. We are adopted, that is chosen by God. Think of that image. We are brought into God's family through Jesus. We are nat natural born children of God. We are children of God because God chose us. I love adoption because it is the closest image we get to how God loves us. You don't get to pick your kids. If you, if you only have kids through biological birth, you do not get to pick your children. I think that's a blessing from God that you don't get to pick your kids. <clears throat> I have four kids. I didn't get to pick any of them. I would have picked different children. They're not in this room. They might hear this. It's okay. I think every parent, when they're honest at times, would be like, man, if I could pick, I'd pick different kids. God picked those kids for me because he knew I needed them and they needed me. But sometimes that picking is very obvious when you say that child is not mine, but I'm choosing to make them mine. And that is exactly what God has done with us through Jesus. We are adopted into the family. A few years ago, um, this is quite a few years ago, uh, my parents are divorced. When I, uh, when I, and my, both my mom and my stepdad, or my mom and my dad got remarried. But when I was in college, and I lived with my dad and my stepmom when I was in high school and then into my first couple years of college. And then I went away to college. And after my second year of college, my first year away, I came home that summer to find out that my dad and my stepmom were getting divorced. My dad was moving out of, of the, from the land and the house that I, I lived in basically since I was born. And my stepmom, very kind, and I love my stepmom, and she said, listen, Jeff, this is still your house. You're welcome back here anytime. And then about a year later, she got remarried and sold that house because she was moving in with her new husband. And I didn't have a home. And I was... And I go stay at, like we had a, like a hunting shack I go stay at if I want to go up north. And I was, uh, one time I was visiting and one of my friends from high school, kind of the guy who kind of led me to Christ, I was at his house just visiting with the family. And his mom heard all about this. And she's like, I'm so sorry. She says, you know that your room is right there, right? You're part of our family too. You come home, this is home. And, for, and for, there was times that I would do that. I would just come, even though my friend was gone, I would just come and stay at their house. And, you know, it was just, uh, I'd call them ahead of time, most of the time. You know, when you're in college, you don't always think about that stuff. And I felt like part of that family. I'm still very close to some of his siblings. Um, I'm less close to him because he lives out on the West Coast, or the East Coast, but I actually am closer to two of his brothers because they live near me. We get chosen to be part of God's family through Jesus. <clears throat> and this is one of those places where people point to and they say, oh, I don't know how to read this, or like, oh, this is, look at this, look what Scripture says, blah, blah, blah. And it says, we have been predestined for this, to be adopted. By the way, you will notice this. If you read Scripture very, very carefully and you look at the idea of predestination in Scripture, it is literally never used in the singular. It is never talked about it, you 
you, it always is you, you all, plural. And the point of that, this isn't a comment about like predestination versus free will. That's not what this is about. The point is that Paul is saying, listen, if you're part of the church, if you are in Christ, you're, you're, you were called, you were chosen, you're predestined for what? To be God's child. That was your destiny from the beginning. It's always a communal thing. You're called to be God's people, his, his sons, he says here, though the, the term there is really inclusive. It means sons and daughters. In the Old Testament, Israel is this, the terminology they use for Israel. Not all of Israel is Israel, but Israel, all the group, not, in, just in, not individuals, the whole group. That's the language that Paul uses. And we are chosen because we are in Christ. It's our position in Christ that says that's, you're predestined to this. And, and we're going to see this, this later where he says, like, he works all things together for the good. Uh, that's in Romans. Why? What are, you, what are we called to? To sonship. That's what our calling is, to be God's children. And like I said, this brings privileges, but it also always brings responsibility. Always. There is never a time that being a child of God doesn't mean we don't have responsibility. And here's one of the responsibilities. Wherever we go, we represent God to other people. We represent Jesus to other people if we're in Christ. We have that responsibility. But here's the beauty of it. We're not doing it on our own. We're doing it through Jesus at work in us because we're in him. Paul's going to get to that in a minute. He says, then we are forgiven. That is, our sins have been paid through for through Jesus' blood. You notice the theme here? All of these things about who we are is because of Jesus, not because of us. We are forgiven. That is, our, our spiritual debt is wiped clean because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. We're redeemed. That's we're bought back from slavery to sin and death. And all of these things, and I don't just mean the forgiveness, all of these things, the adoption, all of this, this is happening through grace. This is also a major theme in the book of Ephesians. It is through God's grace that is unmerited gift from God. Not because of things we've done, but because of God's graciousness towards us in Jesus. Not because of our goodness. But we're told because of his own purpose. And you'll see this again and again. Paul will say to the uh, to the praise of his glorious grace. Why? Why are we praising God's grace? Because it's because of God's grace that we're in Christ. Because God, in his, in his love for us, acted on our behalf when he didn't need to. And it's for his purpose, for his, to accomplish the things he wants to do. Which brings us to the, the last part of our um, text for today. It says, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and under earth and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. By the way, if this seems like 
Like when you read through this, you're like, man, this feels like a giant run-on sentence. It is. If you think it's bad in English, English translators have a tendency to try to break it up into smaller sections so it's easier to read. It is all, uh, um, all of from verse, I believe it's verse 4. No, verse 11 through 14 are all one sentence. Uh, verse 3 through 10 are all one sentence. Not in English, but in the original language. They're all one long sentence. So, Paul continues by saying, not only are we adopted, not only are we, are we blessed, not only are we forgiven, but we are part of God's eternal plan. If we are in Christ, we are part of God's eternal plan. Which he has made known is an, and is accomplishing through Jesus. Jesus makes known the will of his Father and he accomplishes the will of his Father in and through his people. He continues that work out through us and especially when we get to verse 13 and 14, Paul makes it clear how that works. And this is how it works. We are recipients of God's Spirit. When we are in Christ, we get the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit in us. By the way, I'm not wrong in saying it that way, the Spirit of Christ. That is how in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is described. It is the Spirit of Christ in us. We get his spirit. And if you ever want to, if you're ever struggling with, how do I know if I'm really in Christ? How do I know I'm really a Christian? How do I know that this is real and not just something I'm playing at? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 are worth your time memorizing and meditating on. When I was in college, um, I had a friend who was part of the Navigators, and uh, he challenged me to do scripture memory with him. And that's one of the first verses you memorize this, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you too were included in Christ when you first heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing your inheritance to the redemption of those who are his own the praise of his glory. What does that mean? It means that when we are in Christ, God puts his spirit inside of us. And when we have his spirit inside of us, it says it is like your down payment for eternity. Because we are adopted, we are now heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus. What does that mean? It means what is God's is ours. We're his children. But an inheritance is something you get like typically when your parent dies. God's not going to die, but we have access to it. And Paul says you want to know that you're guaranteed that inheritance? Your, guarantee, your deposit guaranteeing that inheritance is the Holy Spirit at work in you right now. It shows that you're his. The work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christians is how we know we're Christians. I'm not talking about like, oh, I spoke in tongues one day, therefore I know. Maybe you did. You also can fake that. I'm talking about the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives on a daily basis, convicting us when it comes to our sinfulness, empowering us when it comes to living holy lives, leading us, telling us when it, we need to speak up, telling us when we need to be quiet. If you have experienced the Holy, work, or the holy Spirit at work in your life, you don't have to ever question whether you're his. You're his. Why? Because he is the deposit guaranteeing it. The guarantee is not based upon you, it's based upon God. God guarantees 
that you're his. In fact, it says he is the guarantee that marks you and seals you as his. That image, by the way, if you want to know where that comes from, it's the image of the Passover. If you go back to the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God had called Abraham and his descendants, and, and, they, and the descendants wind up in Egypt. They're there for 400 years in slavery. And probably even if you don't know the Bible well, you might know enough of the story if you watch the Ten Commandments and stuff. And there's this, the ten plagues of Egypt come, and right before the tenth plague comes, God says, I am going to send the angel of the Lord throughout the land and strike down the firstborn of every home, except for those who are marked as mine. So they take the blood of a lamb and they mark their homes. It is the seal guaranteeing, showing you belong to me. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is that inside of us. In fact, when you read the book of Revelation and it talks about the mark of the beast, it is a counterfeit to the real deal. And you also see that God's people get sealed. They get marked as his own. What is that seal? What is that mark? It is the Holy Spirit. We are his. I heard a pastor say it this way one time, and I was like, well, I mean, the analogy breaks down a little bit, but I get where you're coming from. He said, God liked it, so he put a ring on it. Some of you get that reference, some of you don't, and that's fine. But he's basically saying, like, you're mine. When I wanted to marry my wife, I gave her a ring. She put it on her finger, says, you're mine and I'm yours. The Holy Spirit is God's way of saying, I live in you and you are mine. You're mine now. Who do you think you are? God says, you're mine. Not in a... not in some kind of jealous, negatively controlling way, but in a way that says, I want, I want to be intimate and in, in, in with you in such a way that I want my spirit to dwell inside of you and empower you to live as mine. That was the promise of why Jesus came. In John 1.14, it says, Yet to those who believed in him, those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the, the right to become the children of God. That term right there, it's the Greek word exousia. It means authority. It doesn't just mean like, you can pretend you're God's child. It says, I will not only call you my child, but I will give you the power to actually live it out. And that is the Holy Spirit residing in his people. And by the way, you cannot be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. Here, let me rephrase that. You, cannot be a, you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. We can't. We cannot live holy lives. We cannot be set apart for God without the Spirit of God living inside of us. It is impossible. And for too long, a lot of churches have just said, we're not going to talk about the Holy Spirit because we get uncomfortable because sometimes that gets abused, and it does. But the Holy Spirit dwells inside of all believers. We're told that the Spirit is the one who makes God's, uh, his grace work in and through us. And the Spirit's work in us shows that we truly belong to God. So if there is a day or a moment that you are struggling and you say, I don't know if... I don't know if I'm really, am I really a Christian? Do I really belong to Jesus? Can you look back at your life and say, I know there are moments in my life that the Holy Spirit was at work in me? If the answer to that is yes, then that means you're his. And by the way, that doesn't mean we get to, we get to do whatever we want then. In fact, to the contrary, it means that he gave us his spirit so that we can do what he wants, not what we want. Because with great power comes great responsibility. So here's our so what. I always like to end sermons with so what. 
Are we in Christ? Do we have that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, evident by the Holy Spirit living inside of us? Do we find our identity in him? And do we see ourselves as blessed, chosen, forgiven children who have a part to play in God's plan and work in the world through his spirit at work in us? This is our meditation verse this week. I've already said it a couple of times. It's Ephesians 1, 13, and 14. I'm going to ask Jim to come up, and he's going to lead us in a time of prayer.